Dr. Merrick Walker, Executive Secretary, Jamaica Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, representing the Chairman of the Board of Governors, Northern Caribbean University, Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tufton, Minister of Health and Wellness, Member of Parliament for West Central St. Catherine, Jamaica, Dr. Lincoln Edwards, President, Northern Caribbean University, Dr. Vivian Quarry, Vice President, Academic Administration, Northern Caribbean University, Vice Presidents, Deans, Chairs, and other Administrators, Northern Caribbean University, Members of Parliament and other members of the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Mr. Neil Brevet, President, United Student Movement, Northern Caribbean University, Ms. Sandia Chambers Ferguson, Parish Manager, Manchester Health Services, and other members of the Manchester Health Services, Mr. Byron Buckley, Director, Corporate Communications, Marketing, and Public Relations, Northern Caribbean University, alumni, faculty, staff, and students of Northern Caribbean University, members of the Manchester community, both present and those online, well-wishers, friends all, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We are privileged this afternoon to be blessed with copious showers of rain, and I'm assuming that this will be what we'll be experiencing here as we host this guest lecture, a program presented by the Ministry of Health and Wellness in collaboration with Northern Caribbean University. Our guest presenter will be the Minister of Health and Wellness, Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tufton, MP. We are delighted to have all those who are present in the gymnatorium, those who are following us by virtually, that is, by Facebook and our YouTube channel. We want to recognize the videographer from the CVM and all media personnel from across Northern Caribbean University, and all those who have come here this afternoon for this very special occasion. It is our joy to be hosting this occasion, and we are delighted for the opportunity. We welcome you all and trust that the afternoon will be one well spent. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we have the opening prayer and then a brief devotional thought. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? We thank you, loving God, for your presence with us this afternoon and for the way you have been leading in the life and experience of your children here on the hill, Northern Caribbean University, an institution of your planting. We invite your presence to direct us and grant that all that will be done this afternoon will be according to your divine will and pleasure. To this end, we place the entire program into your hands and thank you for your presence and answering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
word of God comes to us this afternoon from a very special passage of scripture found in the book of Jeremiah. The chapter is 18. And I want to read within your hearing a few verses from 5 through 10 from the King James Version. And then I will take you through the message translation of the same passage. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, said the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the hands of the potter, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. And what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. The message translation reads the same passage thus. Then God's message came to me, can't I do just as this potter does? People of Israel, God's decree, watch this potter. In the same way that this potter works his clay, I work on you, people of Israel. At any moment, I decide to pull up a people or a country by the roots and get rid of them. But if they repent of their wicked lives, I will think twice and start over with them. At another time, I might decide to plant a people or a country. But if they don't cooperate and won't listen to me, I will think again and give up on the plans I had for them. This passage found in Jeremiah is very poignant for us at this time. Jeremiah, in chapter 29, verse 11, he says, and speak about God and his promise to humankind, he said, I know the thoughts I think toward you, said the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So here we find ourselves in the potter's house. Of all the parables that Jeremiah accompanied his message, the one of the potter and the vessel is the one that is most realistic. In a time of apostasies, drastic changes, and dangers for the people of God, the prophet received the command to illustrate the message of heaven directed to the Jews and by extension to our time today by going to the potter's house. There he saw how the potter worked the clay on the lathe, making a vessel that did not turn out well. The vessel broke in his hands, and he had to start over making another one. What lessons, therefore, can we gain from this parable of the potter and the vessel? Number one, we are only damp, soft, malleable clay and susceptible to taking any or various shapes from the divine potter. Number two, we are going round and round in the wheel of life, living circumstances and experiences, sometimes good and sometimes bad, which form or deform us. Number three, we are in his hands. His fingers are working in us. God is using those twists of life to mold our character. Nothing in our lives is fortuitous. Each turn of the clay becomes a divine providence. Number four, God has a plan 
for each of us. The divine potter doesn't make us all the same. He doesn't make us in series. Each of us is unique. His fingerprints in our character makes us unique, yet also useful. Number five, the divine potter isn't always successful with us because he doesn't overwork our freedom. We still are invested with the power of choice. Certainly, human clay is not an inert mass. In fact, we all participate in this process with our submission or our rebellion. Regardless of the direction that we choose to take, we all are in this running together. Therefore, we need to understand that the vessel will break or the vessel will remain intact depending on our responses. Number six, God does not cast away the clay when displeased. Next to the handle, he has water with which he moistens the clay again and begins a new vessel. This is how divine patience deals with us. None of us are perfect or have reached the ideal that God has for each of his children. Certainly, we have made mistakes more than once, but God is not finished with us yet. Each of us is in the potter's hand and becoming a work of art. How many times has our vessel been broken in the hands of the divine potter? How many times has he started over and over again with us? Are we aware of our rebellion or our submission? We should not exhaust God's patience, but instead we should say to him as Saul of Tarsus, what shall I do? Lord, because there is a God in heaven, he can help you to overcome your shortcomings of character and bad personal attitudes. We need to trust him even when we can't trace him. And we thank God that he's a God of the yesterday, he's a God of today, and he's a God of tomorrow. He's a God of the mountain, he's a God of the valley, and he's a God of every in-between space. He's a God of those who love him and he's a God of those who hate him. He causes his rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. He makes his sun to rise on the thankful and the ungrateful. This God knows no limit and he has the capacity to work each of us over and over and over again until we become vessels of honor. That's what God desires to do with each of us. And it does not matter how often you fall, what matters is how often you get up. So it's not staying down and sympathizing with yourself or pitying yourself. It is time to rise up and stand up with God. Trust him and let him act within you. May God bless each of us as we continue this journey with him. In the potter's hand, all will be well. We have coming forward at this time to bring us greetings. The Executive Secretary, Jamaica Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, representing the Chairman of the Board of Governors, Northern Caribbean University, Dr. Merrick Walker. He will be followed by Ms. Sandia Chambers Ferguson, Parish Manager, Manchester Health Services. Immediately as she finishes, our president, Dr. Lincoln Edwards, he will come with remarks and use the opportunity to introduce to us the speaker.
Thank you, Chair. Dr. The Honorable Christopher Tufton, Minister of Health and Wellness, and Member of Parliament for West Central St. Catherine, Professor Lincoln Edwards, President Northern Caribbean University, Dr. Vivian Quarry, Vice President, Academic Administration, Northern Caribbean University, and I salute you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as recognized by the host and that is an accent that you are special and with all respects we salute you. This is an important occasion. I bring you affirmative greetings with all respect and uh, goodwill appertaining to this auspicious occasion and a commensurate endorsement from Pastor Everett Brown, Chair of the Board of Governors, Northern Caribbean University and the President for the Adventist Church, Jamaica Union. We have come to critical times and uh, the necessity of this lecture is critical. We talk about risk. Risk communication, a public health perspective with which our audience online and face to face have come to be engaged today is of critical importance in our institutions, our nation, and uh, the world. And you will agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that this is true, especially as we continue to grapple with a devastating pandemic and a war that makes it extremely, extremely evident that the appropriate communication of risk is of critical importance to well-being. Risk is exposure to danger with uncertainty, with possibility of a negative impact on that which we value. And you will agree with me that the chief of these is our health. The earth has been at risk ever since sin entered its orbit. Consequently, humanity has suffered greatly and has had its life robbed by death. I assure you that God has communicated that health risks can be lessened by the adherence to health principles and laws as indicated throughout the scriptures. The Passover was a stay here in home order as death passed by. En route to the promised land, God gave Israel personal hygiene regulation to ensure public sanitation predicated on the fact that we must love 
our neighbors as ourselves. The law concerning leprosy had 14 days of quarantine. Priests were public health inspectors, and God appointed priests to communicate risk to the community. In closing, I say to you, it is true that in the 21st century, if we follow God's communication of risk, we will be better off. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the President of the Jamaica Union and the Chairman of the Board of Governors, I congratulate the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and particularly our Minister today, Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tufton. We believe that the Bible is clear. The earth is at risk, and we have the mandate to share in communicating the risk so that Jamaica can be a better place. Let's build together one step and then another, and the longest walk is ended. One stitch and then another, and the largest rent is mended. One brick upon another, and the highest wall is made. One flake upon another, and the deepest snow is laid. All the best for this lecture, lecture today. And may we build together as we communicate risk and therefore be prepared for the earth made new where there will be no risk. God bless you and all the best for this occasion. Our previous speaker have already greeted you. I greet you well. It is an honor, pleasure, and humble privilege to be associated with Northern Caribbean University, this noble institution that is unique in offering Christian education and one that is, has a sterling track record in research among other outstanding achievements. The Manchester Health Services is extremely pleased and can boast of the long outstanding and mutually beneficial partnership that has been established between both organizations. Northern Caribbean University is noted for its philanthropic practices to our beloved island the Parish of Manchester, and certainly to the Manchester Health Department. Presently, the Mandeville Comprehensive Clinic is undergoing major renovations, and as such, all services offered have to be relocated in other places. Without hesitation, Northern Caribbean University has extended its generosity to the department by offering us the use of its dental facility. I hasten to say a big thank you on behalf of the department and by extension, the Southern Regional Health Authority. We can assure you that words cannot express our gratitude as your act of kindness will certainly assist us to continue service delivery in oral health to our clients until our renovations are completed. I want to say without reservation that this institution is a true representation of a community of a forward thinkers who believe in fostering national growth through partnership. Having recognized the need, and no doubt analyzing the country's current economic situation, they did not wait for us to approach them for assistance, but demonstrated their true metal of benevolence 
and offered assistance. Certainly, there is no tangible way by which the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the Southern Regional Health Authority, or the Manchester Health Department could compensate you for this outstanding act. Mr. President, the Department is deeply grateful for your benevolence and we thank you and your hard-working team for accommodating us. Our heartiest congratulations to you at Northern Caribbean University for your achievements over the years. As you continue to educate our nation and give service to our country, I encourage you with these words from Charles Spurgeon. May your character not be writing upon the sand, but an inscription upon the rock. May the rock that this institution is be inscribed in all the lives that enter and leave these doors. Thank you and God bless you. Dr. Mary Walker, Executive Secretary of Jamaica Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, representing Pastor Everett Brown, the Chairman of the Board of Governors and President of Jamaica Union. Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tufton, Minister of Health and Wellness and Member of Parliament for West Central St. Catherine. Dr. Vivine Quarry, Vice President for Academic Administration and the main organizer of today's event. Other Vice Presidents, Deans, Chairs, Administrators, Ms. Sandia Chambers Ferguson, Parish Man Manager, Manchester Health Services, and other members of the Manchester Health Services. Other members of the faculty, staff, students who are joining us today and ladies and gentlemen joining us in the audience and online, a pleasant good afternoon. It is an honor to have you all participating in this very special risk communication lecture, which is a collaboration between Northern Caribbean University and the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And we are especially appreciative to have Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tufton as our guest presenter. As the Minister of Health and Wellness, we are confident that Dr. Tufton is eminently qualified to speak from a public health perspective to the health, safety, and well-being of the people of Jamaica. And as such, we thank you, Minister, for taking time out to present to us today. This lecture is especially opportune as three years in, we are still in the throes of the COVID-19 pandemic. And even though the populace is learning to live with the disease, it is still very much present. It is still being spread. People are still being hospitalized and lives are still being lost as many people are not adhering to the health and safety protocols that are in place to ensure public safety. At NCU, we have made this very gymnatorium available as a vaccination site for the Manchester Health Department and also as a location for persons to receive free health screening and care sponsored by the Indian High Commission and other groups. We must be mindful that before the proliferation of COVID-19, there were many other health risks and safety and environmental concerns, many of which are currently being overlooked as people endeavor to deal with the current pandemic measures. Sadly, on Monday of this week, there was a loss of life in Montego Bay in which a car was washed away due to severe flooding. This is both a safety and an environmental concern, 
as many times people are not careful of proper garbage disposal which clogs drains and gullies with the ripple effect of being the, of being the kind of excessive flooding that we see. Sometimes that is also overlooked in the mental health of our children. Over the past few weeks, we have seen the news of school children stabbing each other over mundane things. And to me, this is a major public health concern. Interestingly, it has been said, and rightly so, that our health is our wealth. Unfortunately, many of us are not capitalizing on our wealth as lifestyle diseases are increasing. Many people are not exercising and eating properly, thus risking the health and the health of others around them. Of course, we can't say this about the Honorable Minister, as you only have to look on social media to see evidence of him cycling as a way to improve his health. He is leading by example, and so we are all encouraged to participate in the Jamaica Moves campaign that was instituted by the Ministry of Health and Wellness under the leadership of Dr. Tufton. While we are being encouraged to practice physical social distancing, there must be no distancing of the heart from the many challenges facing our citizens and the nation. Let us encourage each other to rise to the occasion and do our part in transforming Jamaica into the paradise we all know it can be, a place to live, raise families, do business, and prosper. We are therefore thankful for the timely risk communication lecture that Dr. Tufton will share with us today. So again, I welcome you to this outstanding lecture by the Honorable Minister and hope that you may benefit greatly from his discourse. It is also my great pleasure to introduce Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tufton, a graduate of the University of the West Indies and Georgia State University, from which he received degrees in management studies and marketing respectively. He is also a graduate of the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom, from which he earned a Doctor of Business Administration degree. Dr. Tufton served as the Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries from November 2008 to June 2011. As Minister of Agriculture, he spearheaded the expansion of greenhouse farming technology and the creation of agro-processing facilities and redefined the sector's strategic importance to the Jamaican economy repositioning agriculture as a business. Dr. Tufton had the same drive and passion when he headed the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce from June 2011 to December 2011. His focus was on investment facilitation, international market competitiveness, consumer protection, and the creation of a climate of confidence to attract investors. In recognition of his work, Dr. Tufton has received numerous awards. In 2010, he was the recipient of the influential Jamaica Gleaner Man of the Year Award, and in 2018, his Jamaica Moves Initiative received the RJR Gleaner Honor Award for Health and Wellness. He was elected president of the Pan American Health Organization 59th Directing Council, which convenes health authorities to determine the organization's priorities and policies. After leaving the government in 2011, Dr. Tufton served as the co-executive director of the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, a University of the West Indies think tank, while also serving as opposition senator from 2012 to 2016. Dr. Tufton is also a business strategist whose expertise include international business and marketing strategy, specializing in foreign direct investment facilitation and the impact of public policy on industry. He has lectured and conducted business consultancy in Jamaica, the United Kingdom, and the United States of America. 
in several areas, including international marketing, business strategy, and entrepreneurship. Dr. The Honorable Christopher Tufton is now Jamaica's Minister of Health and Wellness, Member of Parliament for West Central St. Catherine, and author of State of Mind, Politics, Uncertainty, and the Search for the Jamaican Dream. We are privileged to have the Honorable Minister speak to us. However, we will have a song by Ms. Glenda Anderson, and then the Honorable Minister will come and address us. Let's give him our undivided attention. Thank you. Microphone check. Okay, great. All right. Uh, good evening uh, to members on the platform representing Northern Caribbean University. The, I'll remove the mask, the Seventh-day Adventist faith. My colleague, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good, good evening to you all. It seems I brought the rain to the beautiful parish of Manchester, right? 
I think it's a cool welcome given that I'm a Manchesterian. Went to Manchester High School. Uh, not this lovely facility or campus, but I, I know a little ar around these parts. Very happy to be here. Now I'm going to be strolling a little. And uh, so I don't want to inconvenience the camera guys too much. And because I don't have a monitor, I'm going to have to look back at the screen. I hope you don't mind that either. Forgive me. And the third request I'm going to ask, can I take off my jacket? Because... Yeah, I don't have to hear I tell you the truth, I'm one of those who support the motion that was moved by MP Anne Marie Vaz in the Parliament about the, the stiffness of the dress code, the, old, the colonial inheritance, right? Um, but that's for another conversation, right? So if you notice, I'm a dress down minister, normally with a branded shirt, no disrespect intended, it's just more convenient for the tropics. So I'm here today and I want to thank. Um, Northern Caribbean University and my team at the ministry and uh, my team of support who has helped me to pull together uh, a conversation, in a sense a reflection on uh, issues around leadership, uh, utilizing primarily public health and in this instance looking at the COVID experience which we're all traumatized by, right? We're hoping to see the end of it, but I suspect we will have to learn to live with it a little more and a little while longer. And uh, I say so because the science is suggesting it, but I believe that we have learned enough that if we approach it the right way, we can in fact live with COVID and restore some sense of normality to our lives and indeed learn from it. So I have taken the position that since I've been on the man on the bridge for the last two plus years at the discretion of the Honorable Prime Minister of Jamaica and I've had to be out there championing the cause about the response, leading the 20 odd thousand health care workers and other frontline workers trying to get the Jamaican people to understand and appreciate why we have to do what we do. It's not always easy. Um, and now that we are where we are, there is a case to be made, a narrative to be developed, which I think as leaders we have a duty to budding leaders, many of you in the audience, some are online, to discuss and to reflect on this experience in the hope that we not only understand it for what it is, but it makes us better and stronger as we approach the future and the possibility of future challenges. This is a one in a 100 year experience. It doesn't mean that the next one is gonna come in 100 years. And indeed, if you look at public health in Jamaica, there is a crisis around almost every corner. You want me to list them out? My tenure, almost seven years. Cornwall regional collapse, a one-year dengue outbreak, Chick V, Zik V, dead baby scandal. You're not sorry for me. And all the time is my fault, right? Most of the time, anyway. <laughs> but we take it, we give God thanks. Uh, it is our time on the bridge, and we run our red leg. And I know one day, some of you, one of you, We'll take the baton and move to the next level. So today it's about risk communication. And this I'm doing as a public duty because I think it's important. And I've done one at UA, two at UWI, one at UTEC, and today I'm here at this institution. I want to discuss the issue of risk communication and take the public health perspective. And I'm going to ask my technical manager to move to a video and hopefully you can hear it play out. The lights are a little challenging. Um, is, it, is it playing? Can you go now?
afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this Oscars afternoon for what uh, is an important development with the coronavirus disease. Uh, Jamaica today confirmed its first imported case of coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-2019, here in Kingston. The patient is a Jamaican female who had traveled from the United Kingdom. She arrived in the island on March 4th, presented to the public health system on March 9th, and has been in isolation since then. However, steps are being taken to prevent the risk of community spread. Imposed travel restrictions uh, remain in place. In fact, three countries have been added to the list of the five that were originally announced. China, Italy, South Korea, Singapore, and Iran are the original countries that was previously made public. We have added to that Spain, France, and Germany. Uh, I'd like to reassure the public that the government of Jamaica, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, um, is doing all that is necessary. So we have been preparing in the event of today, and we have now just triggered the next phase of the response, which, because of an imported case, would include as a priority containment of the particular case so as to prevent the community transmission. So we thank you again, and we will follow, I'm sure, in the further developments. Thank you. So I, I play that clip as a starting point to get you to cast your minds back. about what was transpiring and what had to be done to understand what was an unknown, to tell the public that this unknown exists. Many of them saw it for themselves. They looked at the videos on the, the, the internet, all this stuff in China, and there was panic. And so as far back as December, before that March, late December, we were monitoring we were consulting with the World Health Organization, with PAHO, with our bilateral partners. And we knew that the virus was going to come to Jamaica. We knew because that's the way these things go. Human is the major vector. They carry it. And we live in a very interconnected world. And so our objective wasn't about whether or not we should do what is necessary to stop it. The objective was how do we slow it down in the first instance so it gets here later than it normally would which is why in late january we announced a cabinet decision which i took to cabinet to ban flights from china of course the chinese could not be pleased with that and i understand why and then subsequent to that one or two other countries so fast forward to that day when we announced just think about the feeling in the country at the time. You all may be able to consider how you felt. There was a lot of uncertainty. There are some people who were fearful. They did not understand what the implications would be for work, for school, for their own personal health, because they would have seen what was happening. Now, if you are in a position like that as a leader, and again, we are talking to leaders and leaders in the making here at Northern Caribbean University, what would your objective be? What would it, what would be the signal 
that you want to send. In a sense, you are trying to manage a risk. And there are many components to managing that risk. But your capacity to send signals, to communicate around the nature of the risk and how it will affect you and what leadership was doing about it was absolutely critical. If you look at that clip, in a sense, you can't fully prepare for these things. But if you notice, we were very calm, or I tried to be, because the last thing you want to do as a leader when you're trying to chart your way through a relatively unknown, and for the general public, a totally unknown, is to send any signal that you're either fearful, unsure, lack confidence, because clearly, if you did that, then the response would be over, because people would take matters into their own hands. Once you send panic, it creates a big challenge. And so, three months on from the pre preparation of this virus coming to Jamaica, we kind of had a sense that what we needed to do. And so one of the messages that we would want to transmit initially is that when you manage risk, you try to get as much information as you can. But as you will see, it is not always possible to get all the information you want and oftentimes, particularly in this society, meaning the world, where information is so freely available, including misinformation, oftentimes it's hard to maneuver your way through that kind of clutter to keep confidence levels up. So just to give you some basic definition around health-related risk communication, the World Health Organization speaks to it as a process by which national and local government authorities provide information to the public in an understandable, timely, transparent, and coordinated manner before, during, and after a crisis. And the concept of understandable, timely, very, very important, transparent, because sometimes information is not always what you want to say or what you hope would be the case, but you have to say it anyway. Because the last thing you want to do is to hide information from the public and they find out that you're actually hiding it. Next slide. The issues around managing, the WHO goes on, is that the information should be real-time exchange, advice and opinions between experts, officials, the public, face-to-face, -face, and to ensure that in providing the information, you're really drawing on multiple sources. Because no one source is going to give you the picture that you want to create. And no one source is going to transmit in a way that everybody understands. So in a sense, you approach the crisis as it unfolds with an open mind. But that in itself has challenges because for one reason or the other, you're going to get advice from as many people who think that they understand the crisis better than you. One thing a crisis creates are experts who knows about it more than everybody else, even when they don't know much about it. And you can't really discourage people from giving their opinion because then you come across as being arrogant and you lose the narrative. But you have to also appreciate that the message has to be done in a manner which brings the, all the parties together. So you create a sort of collaborative approach in terms of the conversation. And that means drawing from all and recognizing the concerns of all. Next slide, please. So the issues around the risk response approach, it is, it is always going to be the case, and we saw it in COVID, that every day the narrative has the potential to change. Every day. 
And it's, it's typical of any major risk factor. You know, at one point, there was an issue around what is the cause of COVID. And it was a topical issue at, the point, at one point. I mean, under the Trump administration, for example, he discontinued funding the WHO because he made a global issue around whether COVID started in a lab or it started from the wet markets in that part of China. Anybody recalls that? And the conversation around that was a huge issue to the point where it became an international incident. There was a point when the issues around what is to be used to treat the virus was the dominant conversation. Ivermectin, for example, just to name one. I don't know how many of you have your stocks at home because you believe in it. Um, but it was a dominant conversation. And so one of the things that you have to manage in the communication process around risk is to appreciate that the environment is going to turn out continuous conversations around different approaches to managing the risk. And if you are the leader on the bridge to respond, you have to make a determination as to which direction you go. Um, you ever hear the story of the horse and the, the donkey and the man going to market and every stop he make somebody tell him to lead it and eventually he ended up carrying it to the market well I am not saying you must do everything that you are told to do and take every advice that is offered to you you have to have a way to filter that information and to ensure that you stick to a particular path but as I said earlier it is going to be evolving on a rapid scale. And we saw that manifested during the COVID, during the, the, during the pandemic, and even up to today. Because the narrative today is not, it's, 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 it's vaccine, but vaccine has sort of dissipated. It's about variant strains. The BA2 strain that is now out there. We sent out a release today. And social media is having a field day discussing why it is here, whether it is dangerous or not, what it will, how it will impact hospitalization. There was a time when infection rate was a big issue for us because the more persons infected in the early stages, the more we would end up with hospitalization and the more we would have deaths. Today, while we watch infection rates, we also are more concerned with hospitalization because Vaccination, even though we have a relatively low number here, but between vaccination and persons who have already been infected, the idea or the hope is that that will minimize hospitalization. In other words, if you have COVID and it's not putting you in the hospital, go and go spend a week or four days or five days and get healthy and come back out. And over time, that is going to become the sort of normal narrative, but that has had to evolve over time. And you have to pivot to adjust based on what the science is saying and how you are supporting the issue. The issue of high risk. In a crisis, as is the case in an operating room or an emergency, you have to make a determination as to who is at the greatest risk. Because you're not going to be able to serve everybody. And one of the things that came out in COVID was that Early in the day, we discovered that persons over 60 years would be the most vulnerable. But more, over 60 years with underlying conditions, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, that kind of stuff. And so when we implemented the policy around vaccination, given that vaccines were in short supply in the early stages, the issue was that not everybody would get access in the early stages. Do you recall that it was first the healthcare worker because they would be frontline, greatest risk. But then after that is the 60 years and over. Because as at that point, the science was suggesting that there are persons who would, younger people who would get the virus, but they would only be sick enough to recover. But we had an incident in St. Catherine, Portmore, 
when there was the big outbreak at the BPO center. And some of the young people in that center, that call center, got the virus, took it home, and there was one case where the mother of one of that young person died because they got it from the, 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 their, their, their son. And what that drove home to us was that while we have to give added protection to the older population, we have to understand also that the younger population are super spreaders, potentially, of the virus. And so the protocol had to change based on the evolving situation that was unfolding at a particular point in time. One of the things that brought out to us, which is another lesson in leadership around crises, is that you really never truly have all the information that you require. And you can get into a position where you become paralyzed into inaction by trying to have all the pieces of the puzzle to make a decision. At no point did I have all the information as minister. And I had many advisors. And I sought out my own advice to research. I read a lot. And sometimes when I was challenged on particular issues, it's not that I know everything. I talk confidently because I don't want to project fragility or vulnerability. But the information was never always there. So in a sense, you kind of use your best judgment. And you have to use your best judgment. But you do put in place the ability to garner as much information as possible. Next. So why do you engage? Or how do you engage? What is your specific targets and objectives around the crisis management communication? First of all, you want to influence behavior in terms of how people respond. Very, very important. Because when you're dealing with a mass response and you have to mobilize, it is difficult to have people going off in all different directions. So one of the things we, have, we did as a government with COVID was that we tried to communicate in a consistent way but also communicate a consistent message. And I'm not going to tell tales out of school, but certainly at the level of cabinet, we spent hours for the better part of a year and a half, every Monday, sometimes more, more often than that, discussing the response. And it's not that everybody had the same idea as to what to do. In fact, the reason you spend hours in these discussions is because sometimes the views were diametrically opposed to the point where people were fiercely defending opposing positions. Because we're human, we all have our sources of information, we all have our opinions, our beliefs. What that led to was a dialogue that was necessary, and I, I must say the Prime Minister has to be credited for that because he facilitated that. I have to be credited for it because I was the victim of a lot of the um, criticism, so either not doing it this way or not doing it that way, right? But ultimately, you want to come out with one. And the issue there is to get the country to respond. Now, one of the challenges with COVID is the extent of the time it took to get to where we are. We're still at it. But in the early stages, fear drove people to listen and to support a particular approach. The non-clinical measures, the shutdowns, the curfews. There was a time when you go on the road at 7 o'clock, nobody would be there. Over time... Fatigue set in. People missed their loved ones and friends. They had to work. They had to hustle. They just felt mentally drained. And so the measures really wasn't making a big difference. They took their chances. And that became very difficult because you had to know sometimes adjust, even sometimes to accommodate, recognizing that there were some side effects from some of the restrictions that were going on. So you kind of predicted and understood after the first wave that there would be a second and there would be a third because of some of the restrictions that you had to ease in order to accommodate some of the other challenges that were in the society. And so in a sense you were planning 
to withdraw in order to advance. Difficult decisions because all of those decisions come with risks. And indeed, in some instances, people die because of the exposure and because of the decisions that they make based on what they perceive to be the ideal or the necessary approach. So we respond to these concerns. We initiate discussions with stakeholders all around trying to manage the movement of the process. And I know that we spend hours talking to the faith-based communities, the community-based associations, the private sector groups, many meetings trying to get them to appreciate the narrative which was evolving but had to be communicated in real time and in a transparent way in order to achieve consistency. And that's very critical. Next. The, 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 a key feature of the communication approach in the crisis, the COVID crisis, was to, as I said, be not only consistent, but to be timely in terms of the messaging. When we started, we had press briefings twice a week. Prime Minister had one at Jamaica House. I had one every Thursday called COVID Conversation. We decided that we were going to use everything and everybody for branding, for messaging. If you notice, that's me out in the streets and you look at the back of my arm thing. It says, beat COVID-19, wear your mask, wash your hands, keep your distance. If you notice too that the spelling is not found in the English dictionary because it really was about responding to trying to communicate. But the reason we had those ongoing press briefings was because we knew that the discussion would get out into a realm where influences could be brought to bear on the consistency of the message to make the message disjointed in terms of what measures to take. And we saw many evidence, many, much evidence of that in terms of remedy, in terms of what was happening in a hospital. Indeed, in the early stages of COVID, there were threats to people's lives who were felt to have COVID even though they didn't have it. I must tell you, one of the breaking points for me, one of the points, one, one, the, the period when I felt most emotional around COVID was the death of young Shanika Mary, because this is a pregnant woman who ended up at three hospitals uh, and unfortunately died um, in child's birth or, or shortly after. But a lot of it surrounded the fear of the virus. Patient zero, subsequently called patient one, out in Bull Bay, who came from the UK, who was tested. We had to put police outside our home for days because they were threatening to burn it down. And there are a number of incidents like that, cases like that. So part of the communication process is to keep on top of the unfolding events and make it very consistent and do so in a way that lends some credibility to the process. With the COVID conversation, one of the speakers there on that slide was a PAHO representative from Washington. And that was because we felt that we needed the added credibility at the time of an individual who is steep in the expertise and the assessment to lend some credibility to the, to the, to the response. Next. The challenge of managing multiple sources of information is another big, big issue with the need for quick turnaround of that information. We had to depend a lot on WHO POW, the World Health Organization, the Pan American Health Organization, but we had our regional, CARFA, which is part of CARICOM. We had national, the hospitals and the experts. We had local your doctor, who you go to, in the doctor's office. And of course, we have other stakeholders like the PSOG and others. We also have John Public, who call all the radio programs every day. You know, you have some consistent callers. And if they believe in something, every day they're on the radio. And you'd be surprised to know how many people they, they influence. So one of the things that we had to put in place as part of the team response 
is a mechanism to absorb all of that information and to filter out of that information a response. And in a sense, we had to decide how we target the information that is out there that may have been causing the greatest uncertainty or fear and then choose what to respond to or what to endorse, support, or otherwise. You know, you have doctors who are opposed to vaccines, and they, have, they are in front of their name. So when a doctor goes on a radio program or a TV program and says this vaccine is a foolishness, you have a lot of people who believe because he's a doctor, he knows what he's saying, and he's correct. And it, it undermines, to a large extent, or potentially, the entire approach to your wanting people to take up vaccines. The anti-vax movement has gotten far more powerful out of this COVID experience than was the case before. And one of the things that we're going to have to do as we move forward as public health, as a country, and indeed as a world, we're going to have to mount a serious challenge to justify the value of immunization. Because that's what it is. Our human development index, our life expectancy at 70 odd years, is largely due to vaccination. And the truth is, with a 24 or 25 percent take up, not many people bought in to the COVID 19 vaccine. And the information that was created from the various stakeholders sometimes created a lot of harm to that process. Next. So, the managing the source and the complexity of the information, one of the, 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 the key approaches that we have taken is to access credible sources. So we follow the science, as it says. Um, oftentimes when we get pushback on whether we're doing what we're doing and why it is correct or not, we go to the research to the be best of our knowledge. And one of the good things about managing a crisis that is global in nature is that we have a pool of experts within a WHO or power. Now, we have been criticized by some people for, not fo for following the multilateral like PAHO and WHO, who we are members of, by the way, and we have some experts in Jamaica who are aligned and part of that research. But the truth is, if we don't do that, then we do not establish the core response that is necessary around the science of the challenge. And because COVID was evolving and there was much uncertainty, we had to use what the researchers came up with as the core and then pivot and adjust as the time, over time, to adjust for the local environment. Next. And in doing so, that adjustment had to bear in mind our local circumstances. So not everything that was being done elsewhere, even though we're following the science, we, we abided by in adjusting here to Jamaica. So, for example, we were criticized for not using pharmacies to administer vaccination. I don't know if you recall that, but that was a big conversation. Nobody examined the context between Jamaica and the U.S., because more often than not, the U.S. was used as the benchmark. If they're not doing it, if they are doing it, we should be doing it. But first of all, nobody, many people who were critical in that way did not recognize that in the early stages, the U.S. had so many bodies from COVID, they had to store them in ice skating rings and in refrigerated containers. We never ever got to that point. And we never got to that point because, and I could be politically incorrect, but there were many in the U.S. at high levels of the political directorate who really never really believed in COVID. We believed in it when we saw it evolving out of China. We started to prepare. But there's another reason why context is important, even though we follow the sand. And that is that Jamaica has one of the most comprehensive primary healthcare infrastructures. And when compared to the U.S., they have none. So the U.S. has to depend on private sector players 
like the pharmacies, to deliver vaccines. Their pharmacies are trained to deliver vaccines. Our pharmacies are not. They would have to be trained. We have 325 health centers across Jamaica. And everyone, or most of them, you go in, there's a nurse who is the primary applier of vaccines. In fact, there's competition. When you go to the arena, go to the big auditoriums, the doctors stand up looking at the nurses because the nurses refuse to allow the doctors to, take, to, to administer vaccines because that's their territory. And they guard it zealously. A few of them, are you nurses? Are nurses? Nurses? Um, am I correct? Or, or right or wrong? Huh? The primary healthcare nurse is the all powerful in the community. More powerful than the doctor because they are more present. And they are the ones who administer vaccines. You hear the amen over there? And no matter how we try to get the doctors to complement and support and to expand, many of them came to me and complained and said, Minister, the nurse don't want me to get no vaccine. We have had that. I have had that. I've had that many times at the arena. All right? they, they, they'll tell you. That's not America. My America's experience is very different from ours. So when there was a big hillabaloo around, why are we not expanding the cadre to include private doctors? There's a context. And we tried to explain it, but not everybody was listening, or you know, not everybody listens. Tell the private doctors, we throw out an offer to private doctors across the country to come on board. After about a month, we had about 10 who said they would come on board and do it. We offered to some pharmacies. Some of them are doing it now, like Fontana. They hired the nurses to do it. But sometimes it's the same nurse that they take from the health center and use in the pharmacy uh, to do overtime and extra time. And so there is a point at which, when you're managing the process, you come to a determination that, listen, you kind of have to create your own path because your context is a lot different from others. And if you benchmark, as our country likes to do, and I understand why, aspirationally, we all like to want to be like the U.S. We all want to be developed. Then the debate becomes that much more intense because even some of the most learned in the society are of the view that you're doing nonsense because you're not doing it like the U.S. or you're not doing it like Canada. And no matter how you explain that the circumstances are different, so guess what you do? You don't carry the donkey to market. You just keep riding the donkey and allow that to be classified as, next slide, as noise. So one of the, this is a very interesting slide because the, the COVID response, even though I believe we have done well, could have been a lot more effective in a perfect scenario. But again, I say one of the common themes that permeates through crisis management is that there's no perfect scenario. There's no perfect information. You're going to make some mistakes. The key is to be so consistent with your assessment and recalibration that you correct any of those mistakes very quickly. And if you have to eat crow, then you do it and you move again. Now, a key feature of the COVID experience of the crisis was misinformation, and I term noise. Now, what noise is, is that the simplest way to explain noise is that by the time you get into your car and drive three miles to your home and turn on your radio and watch your TV, you're exposed, if you really check it, to probably 100 plus different types of distractions around goods and services. You pass 50 billboards on the way home. You listen to the news, they have 100 different ads. You go home and you see it on the products on your dining room table. In a sense, after a while, you kind of tune out. Or you become very confused. Because everything claims a benefit to you. And this is the case with what would have transpired when the urgency and the uncertainty of the situation dictated a search for solution. And in the COVID experience, what we found was that there were so many 
proposals around solutions. Some of them intentionally deliberate to sway conversation to a particular point of view. In some cases, it was not intended for the greater good either. It was self-interest. We had a lot of self-interest conversations. Why should we shouldn't have curfew? Why nightlife was important? You know, the virus travel a night and travel a day, so why you lock up curfew in the night time? You've heard that one, right? Well, the truth is, we could lock up day too, but we would disturb more people. It would disrupt and dislocate more people. The issue is to cut back on some of the hours of movement. But it was an argument nevertheless, and some people bought into it and believed it. But in a sense, it served a particular interest. Now, I'm not being critical of stakeholder interests. But when you are in a position where you have to balance all the interests, where you have to serve the greater good, you're going to come under criticism for appearing to be not as responsive to any particular one interest. And sometimes you're going to have to say no. And you do get the experts that justify the science of the response in the interest of particular stakeholder interests. And you have to be very mindful of that. Then there was a low trust environment, which is worth mentioning, because whether we like it or not as politicians, we have to accept that we are not on a high trust rating, right? So when I talk, I'm not as believable as pastor here who delivered the sermon earlier on. No, what is interesting about that was when the first set of vaccines came, there was one section of the population saying, you take it first. They can't be the trust it. So you, you go, they're going to take it first, right? You have to be the one, the guinea pig. And another section say, you're wicked to be taking the vaccine first. Make somebody who really need it take it. You're protecting yourself first. So you got caught in the middle to take it or not to take it. When do you take it? The Prime Minister ultimately said, we're going to wait a little. And then that started another round of conversation as to why we're not taking it. I'm making the point that what we did to overcome some of the low trust environment as policymakers was to engage stakeholders. And so I remember being at the Pegasus Hotel with all the church leaders, the, the faith-based leaders, the Anglican church, the Catholic, your church leader was there, your uh, the Seventh-day Adventist uh, faith, and all gave presentation supporting. But we also know that when it came to the community churches, there were mixed sermons around whether or not to take the vaccine. And so we had to now go deeper to the community-based groups and so on. Uh, the cultural norms, the expert advice, doctors saying one thing, saying another. And some of the influencing of people as to what they did and not do, which we had to overcome, was caused out of those cultural norms and sometimes pure ignorance. I mean, they, they really don't know. Uh, you know, the chip in the vaccine, the vaccine is the mark of the beast, the COVID conspiracy, because the virus was created in a lab, infertility or agility, right? There are a lot of nurses and who tell me that, boy, you know, I don't have any children yet, you know, and this thing, I hear that it's going to make me not have children. Or one guy who was on social media in very graphic terms as to what happened to his manhood when he took the vaccine. About three months after, he said it returned. And, and I was happy that he said that. But you would be surprised how those conversations drive the discussion and the belief. And the question is how you sieve your way through that using experts, using influencers. After a while, it wasn't so much about experts. It was more about influence. Because if you, in a sense, believed in a particular individual institution and they gave a particular advice, you would be more inclined to believe them, even if they were not a quote-unquote expert. So you target influencers, you help them to understand, and then you use them as conduits to promote the particular approach. Next, please. We're winding down. 
the, the issue of the response priorities, because of all of this, you, you now are caught in a situation where you have to make a decision as to what you respond to. Because you can't respond to everything when people are offering so many different views. And so you have to take a, an approach, assessing the environment, and that is to determine what is having the greatest impact at a particular point in time. Monitoring and evaluating the impact and choose a response that's most important. So on that part of the slide, we pivoted because we realized that whether we tried or not, the second Christmas after the COVID uh, virus couldn't be a lockdown Christmas totally. People were just going, COVID had many side effects, you know. Some of it we're still grappling with. Mental health is one of them. It's another conversation. But, you know, economic issues, all sorts of issues. So we said, okay, if the rules are going to be adjusted to allow for greater movement, knowing what Christmas is, knowing the travel market that's coming in, tourism wanted some of that and so on, but the diaspora who wanted to come look for their people or leave out of cold, cold New York because it was more mentally challenging there to be locked up in a room than to come here and have a little sun, let us develop a campaign. And that's how we hit the streets to talk about mask up before you talk up. Because we chose one message at the time that I said we were going to push for that two to three weeks of December into January. Wear your mask. That's it. Because there was no sense in going out there to say stay home or going out there to say don't go visit your grandmother. Or if your family member come from far and don't organize a little Christmas dinner, where you come together. You kind of try to find what may be the greatest protection to apply in a very simplistic way so that you can get not just reach, which is the art of communication, but more importantly, you can get impact. You can influence. And we designed this campaign and, you know, I don't know how many times I've had COVID. I've never been diagnosed with it. But I have gone to every hotbed of COVID that Jamaica has had over the last two years. And I recall I was pretty sure that I was going to get it after this campaign because during Christmas I went to almost every marketplace in Jamaica. Everywhere people congregate. I was wearing my mask, I had my sanitizer, and I brought these very primary healthcare nurses and community health aides. And we were role-playing a demonstration with those signs that says, mask up if you want to talk up. You remember that? And that was only for that season. The point is that you prioritize the messaging to deal with the challenge. Next, please. Because you can't carry everything. All right, this is second to last slide. So, I've learned a lot from the COVID experience. And I've learned a lot since being Minister of Health. This is going on seven years. I've been two other ministers, but this one has been the most challenging and the most rewarding. Because for me, there is a sense of satisfaction internally, despite the measly pay that you get from knowing that you have helped someone out of a situation of distress, personal distress, family distress, into a situation of some level of comfort. And that's what you do when you help persons who are sick, right? And, and we do it every day, right, nurses? Every day. But there is a case to be made around how we communicate around a big public health challenge that we face. And I, I cite the case of lifestyle diseases, non-communicable diseases, a big, big case in point, because we're losing the battle on that. 75, almost 80% of our deaths in Jamaica are caused by people who have diseases that are linked to their lifestyle. So whether it's cardiovascular disease, cancers, strokes, hypertension, diabetes, all linked to the foods we eat, salt, sugars, fats, tobacco, alcohol, um, 
the lack of physical activity, the way we manage stress, lack of rest, that sort of thing, lack of a social setting to relax us and so on, all of those end up getting us into a state where we have premature illness and ultimately we meet our demise or we live taking a lot of tablets. And part of it is the way we have communicated our own sickness and what the solution to it is. Where we focus too much on the clinical science. When a doctor says to me, you have to cut back on the drinking, you know, because your blood pressure is going up. More often than not, we say, yes, doc, yes, doc. But we go out and the drinking eventually start back, unfortunately. No matter how much graph and chart the doctor explain. What you find is that you are able to deal more effectively with behavioral change if you engage and understand human behavior and what drives human behavior. So I am on this mission as Minister of Health. I am a social scientist, right? I'm not a clinical scientist, where I believe there has to be a much greater integration of social science with the clinical sciences in order to change behavior and we nudge people into health-seeking behavior. So clinical versus behavioral, science versus beliefs. The science says one thing, but your belief systems, even though that influenced by the science sometimes, says another thing, and the science loses. Because your belief systems that are going to drive how you operate. When I've, I've said it publicly, and I'll say it again. One of my admirations for this Seventh-day Adventist faith is the extent to which you integrate in a much more significant way the, the kind of health-seeking lifestyle that is associated with your spiritual mission. It's, it's fundamental. And it's, it's proven to help you, as I've said earlier, with the, if you read the Blue Zone that says members of your faith tend to live two to three years on average longer than others. Because... Your body, is indeed, your body is indeed the temple. And if you don't take care of it, it's not, you shouldn't be influenced by the fact that you're looking for a life after, not to ensure that you live a healthy life here. Again, that's for another time. But beliefs, critical. Facts versus perception. Marketers will tell you that they drive perception. And it is perceptions that drive actions. It's not so much about the facts, unfortunately, even though ultimately you can challenge the perception, but it is how you get people to feel a particular way. And so the persuasive arguments are going to be very important, even though you're providing information. And even with the legislation, we have a tendency not to follow laws, unfortunately, especially if it's difficult to enforce them. How do you convince people to? So when we spoke about the Jamaica Moves program, which, which we initiated, which was spoken about earlier, the Jamaica Moves program was conceived based on a recognition that Jamaicans had a particular lifestyle which they enjoy. They like to party, they like to dance, they like to, you know, overindulge. Uh, we're a colorful nation, festive, but we're also unhealthy in terms of what that lifestyle has led to. So it really was an attempt to use a concept that was grounded in the clinical science around lifestyle, but leverage the existing cultural practices to achieve a healthier society. So if you notice, when you went to a Jamaica Moves workout, we had 5,000 people in the audience dancing to performers and dancers to the best soca and reggae and religious music um, and they, they danced for five hours and the only thing that we served there was water nothing else you had a few guys at the sidelines you know did them little herbs and spices but they weren't allowed as part of the main attraction and people loved it when we did a branded shirt people loved to identify with it when we do better for you menu in the restaurants which we are now implementing the reduction of sugary drink in schools to nudge habitual preference for less sugar. Those are all policies that are aimed at trying to drive a behavior and nudge people into particular behavior. And I do think 
that coming out of COVID that has been reinforced. And it is more reinforced for me as important because most of the people who died from COVID were already sick. Very, very profound if you look at it. 90% of the deaths in COVID were people who were suffering from some other form of ailment. Their compromised immune system is what made it worse for them. Healthy people didn't die from COVID. It was people who had hypertension, diabetes, obese, those were the ones who died. And so the future dispensation around communication in public health is to recognize that we do have a chronic crisis that's bigger than COVID. NCDs claim 16,000 people every year. We have about 18,000 deaths a year. Probably 15,000 of that is, is from lifestyle-related diseases. And the way to solve it is not to keep preaching to people that sugar causes obesity. It's to start giving people information, requiring lower sugar in our drink, on our beverage, and trying to get people to live a particular experience that protects them. Next. And that's the conclusion. Next final slide. Communication in crisis is not a one size fits all. We couldn't use pharmacies as they do in America to administer vaccines. But it does help to understand that vaccines are universally uh, appropriate. Um, it requires building public trust. As politicians, we alone couldn't do it because we had, a, we had some level of trust, but our trust factor is low. So we use the doctors, the nurses, the pastors, and so on. It requires constant monitoring of your environment. It requires transparency. When you have bad news, you mustn't try to hide the bad news. I, I've, I've always told myself that a politician who only have good news and only announce good news is one that becomes discredited over time. Right? So what people look for more is sincerity. And if you project sincerity, you get a consistent response because none of, nobody believes that you're infallible and that you don't make wrong decisions and that you don't sometimes make mistakes and that sometimes it's even out of your control. You must be able to face the music if you have the responsibility. And I think even in crises, if we don't do that, we run the risk of being more discredited than before. And then culture and context, as I said earlier, the noise is a big distraction if you're not sure of yourself and having made a decision, you stick by the decision because there's always an alternative view somewhere. And as I said in closing, we integrate the behavioral sciences with the clinical sciences. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking so long. Thank you, Minister. We have 15 minutes of questions, so we're going to take them now. We have two mics in the audience, and I'm inviting our friends on YouTube. I'm, I'm monitoring the chat. I'll take questions, too. But as moderator, I'll ask the first question. Minister, you, men, you keep mentioning the low, that they, the, in terms of politicians, that they were low in terms of the credibility. What's the word you use? They, they were low. Trust. Low trust. And so, therefore, I want, all this funny to me, I want to ask you, it appeared that the, the medical group, the medical association, the professional groups were not, it appeared, were not part of the, the policy making or certainly the communication of it. And so it appeared at times as if they weren't part of it. What was the relationship in terms of those group things? Not the private doctors by themselves, no, but the, the association, the nurses, the medical association. Um, there was always constant communication with the, the medical groups. The, the, the medical groups, by the way, are many. The major ones being the Nurses Association and the, the two main Doctors Association. Um, that dialogue continued, but they had their own issues that they were contending with and continue so. I mean, it, it's still a, a big challenge. The, 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 the heavy burden on them to manage the pandemic, because they are the frontline people. The fatigue. Um, 
the, 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 the conflict, not, not physical conflict obviously, but the conflict around to vaccinate or not, that they, they, while vaccination levels are higher generally among that cohort during this COVID pandemic, on average, medical uh, health staff don't take the flu shots, for example, every year, as they should, because they are uh, uh, vulnerable. So oftentimes, the discussions behind the scene was to try and ensure that we kept everybody together. And, uh, and so you would not have seen some of that conversation in the public space. Where it was necessary, we did have some of that. But also, the, the clinicians will always, and I believe rightfully so, because of their discipline, their training, take the clinical view about the response. The policymaker has to weigh in the balance several other viewpoints. And sometimes it did create conflicts with the clinicians. So the issue of mask wearing is a big issue. Um, you know, kids staying out of school versus going back to school. People staying home versus going back to work. The, the strict clinical response is, hey, let's keep people apart so we'll get to, get to the end of this. But the multifaceted response is people have to work. Uh, children need to get back to school. And so there's always going to be some levels of of, of, of disagreements, but I think it all augurs well for the greater good once we can collaborate, and we normally do. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? You're going to need to stand by the two mics. Any questions? Any comments? Any, any commendation for the minister? <laughs> I have 10 minutes. Or, yeah. Could you go by the mic, please? Yes. All right. So there are mics on both flanks. All right, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Tufton, for your very enlightening lecture. As a frontline worker on the ground educating people who came to the clinic. I am very happy that you have come today to share what this information because I too got caught up in many of these difficult um, question and answer sessions mm -hmm. where I was being asked, um, did you take the um, vaccination? Are you going to take it? and all sorts of things, you know. So I'm very, very happy that you have come to share so broadly about what you experienced so that I could learn more about what really happened. Because really on the ground, it was really tough to deal with all the challenges that one faced. And so I particularly want to thank you for coming to share. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Welcome. Minister, you mentioned about influencers. In the old days before that word came in vogue, we talk about um, peer, peer counselors and so on. And I'm wondering, did the, did the communication program take in consideration? You know, I know you use them, for example, having the head of the denominations take their thing, but in terms of passing, sharing the message, was there a program to find those people in the grouping, tell them, and then they were the ones to pass on to others. What was that? Right. So we did work with a number of other stakeholder groups. The PSOJ, for example, private sector group, played a big role. They financed a lot of the communication. They went out sometimes in the field, and, and they were a critical part of just trying to get the message out. Um, we, we used um, trained personnel to go out um, on the mental health front, because we did realize that after a while there was a lot of loneliness, depression, anxiety. People were confined to their homes. So we started a program by the name of Reach Out Rangers. We trained persons to go and visit people in their homes and so on. Uh, so there were, there, were, there were several attempts at collaboration um, and some more effective than others. But that was necessary, as I said earlier. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Smith. Gentlemen. Yes, he can go in. And he's a newsman, he can wait. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Honorable Minister, commendations to you.
for the way you led from the bridge during the pandemic. As a Jamaican, I was personally proud of you, you know, you. proud of the way you stood up to the pressure, and we wish you all the very best. Something I've observed, and you said it in your presentation, I pick up that there seemed to be a vicious cycle, because you have said it repeatedly, that the majority of the persons who have died from COVID were already sick. So it appears to me there's a vicious cycle. Listening to the stats you've presented, um, we have lost about two, over two year period, about 2,900 persons from COVID. Compare that to an annual loss of approximately 15,000 persons. Now I'm asking probably a rhetorical question or you may be able to answer. How much have we spent to contain, prevent, curtail the spread of COVID over the two year period? And how does how do you and the government compare that to what you have been spending and are now about to be spending to contain what is obviously the real pandemic, that of lifestyle diseases? Right. Thank you. So that's a good question. Um, the, I don't have the figures here, but we certainly spent a lot on COVID. I, I, in fairness, at no point did I ask for additional sums and was not granted. Um, because the government was really concerned about overcoming and minimizing the debts. Um, but it, it runs into the billions of Jamaican dollars, right? Um, five, six, seven billion dollars or more. The, the response to lifestyle diseases would be more because each year it occupies the greatest percentage of our budget around hospital care, doctors, nurses, NHF prescription drugs, that kind of thing. So there is no doubt that we spend more around NCDs, non-communicable diseases. I think a more fundamental point though, um, and it was reflected in the slide around uh, behavioral versus clinical science, is the extent to which we have allowed as a society a normalization of a crisis. It's almost like crime. You hear that somebody gets shot now and it you know, really mean anything anymore because them get shot every day. And there is not the similar level of panic, anxiety, concern, unfortunately. And one of the things that we have to do in public health now, I'm going to stick to my portfolio, is that we're going to have to find a way to, to highlight the, the kind of chronic nature of the NCD crisis that we have, so that people begin to take it more seriously. And that is at all levels of society, including my level, it's legislators. Um, you know, we have to get the consumers more engaged in some of the decisions that they make and link that to their seeing it as in their best interest. Because, because it is so regular, so frequent, it becomes almost an expectation that people no longer are as concerned about until it happened to them. I mean, I get the calls every day. The ones who want to go in hospital want a bed, they want a surgery because of them heart, they have cancer, they want chemotherapy drug. Um, but before it happens to them, it's not that serious. When it happens to them, then some, the house has gone through the gate already. But that's a real challenge. Thank you. Thoughtful presentation, Minister. You touched on it during the presentation, but I was hoping you would elaborate on it a bit more. And that is communicating effectively in the face of false information, especially in a climate where persons don't necessarily trust the authorities or you have authorities sharing different views on this crisis, so to speak. So how do you handle that? You know, in the early days we heard about 5G, you know, causing COVID-19 and all of that. How do you manage that? So, <clears throat> if, if you assess, which is why we say assess the, the, the extent to which a, a, a narrative is a dominant narrative, which is throwing you off track, you have to further dissect the narrative to determine where the challenge is. So if the challenge is the content, then you have to provide greater content support if the challenge is the messenger, 
Can you change the messenger? So one of the things that we did was to try and get multiple sources that would appeal to multiple audiences that would carry levels of credibility with those audiences. And the content would be varied, both in terms of how it's delivered and how it is made up. Because wear your mask, keep your distance, KIP distance. You think on my back of my shirt? Mm. I mean, that's the community engagement. Yeah. So we're really going out there to say to people, listen boss, keep your distance. You go out there and say, keep your distance, six feet apart. Them say, what, what am I talking about? I don't even know where six feet is, unfortunately. So it really is how you adjust to deal with that. Okay. Mr. President, go ahead. And, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, you mentioned the non-communicable disease crisis. But we know that underlying most, if not all, of these NCDs is stress. Stress is the, the underlying factor for, for, for these diseases. So the Jamaica Moves campaign is one way to handle stress through exercise. What is, uh, are you willing to say to the Jamaican people to help them deal with these diseases? Because the, the whole issue of stress is just prevalent throughout the society. So how, how, how can our people deal better with stresses in their life? And what, what can institutions such as NCU and other institutions, what role can we play in helping the Jamaican people to cope and therefore minimize exposure or developing these NCDs? All right, so let me just claim lack of expertise on, on managing these things. I'm not a clinician, and so I, I, I wouldn't want to venture to give advice without that caution, <laughs> right? What I will say is that I agree with you that the society now is experiencing perhaps a, a, a surge in stress factor, and all institutions, including the church, needs to take recognition of that, and we have to define a path that will take us into the next year or two, recognizing that it's going to be a big issue. Um, you see it in the schools, the aggression, the lack of coping mechanisms that are confronting us. People want to lick you down for the least thing. Uh, people doing all sorts of things. In fact, all the evidence is pointing to an increase in mental health challenges. Now, mental health is a stigma word. So when you tell people that they have mental health issues, them, them offended because them say, you say they're mad, right? The, the stigma. Because there's a perception around it. So to answer your question in a general way, and it's something that I'm going to speak to in the sectoral and the third, we have a program that we're working on to deal with it, is how do you promote mental wellness? I, want, I rather use that term in a society that really is suffering from a significant case of mental challenges, um, anxiety, you know, fear, depression. They're not walking around naked and sleeping on the streets, but they are in the head office and they're on the floor of the shop sweeping it and them feeling stressed out. Now, there are many ways to do it, but you have to f help people to overcome by giving them an opportunity for coping mechanisms. We have to, we want, we have to provide an opportunity for them to to speak and for you to listen, um, to provide some advice before you get to the clinical level. Uh, it's about your social circle and setting. Um, we, want, we have a program that wants to do community engagements, to check on the children, to make sure they're going back out to school, to train our guidance counselors, to recognize deviant behavior, not as a bad child, but as a child who needs to be brought into a particular forum and circle. Um, we're going to have to find a way to, to get the society to come to terms with de-stressing around their immediate circle and environment by focusing less on the source of the stress and trying to focus more on how they can overcome that. Now, it's not an easy task, which is why I can't give you a simple answer. But I do believe it's going to have to be an all-of-society approach. And I certainly believe the church has a big part to play because you are influencers in your sphere. 
and you're going to have to provide that leadership by helping to identify those who are going through it and providing a forum for them to help them to overcome it. Last questions. I start here and then I'll finish here. Yes, thank you, Minister Thompson. Tamara Bailey from the Jamaica Gleano. Now, with the public health system not yet fully recovered from the ongoing pandemic, even though there has been a significant decline. With this new variant that we have here, how ready are we in terms of our public health systems? Can we manage an upsurge? And additionally, do you think it was a hasty decision to abolish the DRMA? Okay. I, I certainly believe that we can manage if, if clinically, if we, if we were to see another upsurge. Um, remember now, there are a lot of adjustments to how we, have, how we are measuring the risk, because the COVID issue is really about risk management. So in the past, as I said, it's really around infection rates when the virus was novel and it had the greatest impact. Although we have variant strains, for much of the population, the virus is not as novel. People have built up some immunity and so on, whether naturally or through vaccination. To the extent that it affects those who are most vulnerable, older, compromised immune systems, then I believe the hospital is well capable, or hospitals, to respond. Uh, we, we only had, I checked on the way here, I think we have about 15 people in hospital now. We have 750 beds, uh, COVID wards, some are now being transitioned back into dealing with some of the other problems, but we could transition back if necessary. So that is not bad uh, compared to previous periods. And if it were to get worse, we believe we could, we could cope. We also think, I think, that the experience of the, la of the last three surges makes us a lot more capable to deal with any future surge. So things like where the bottleneck was with oxygen, we have improved on that. Ventilators, we have improved on that. And I could go on and on. We have, you know, the, 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 so people are more experienced. So I think we're in a much better place now than we were before. Having said that, we can't be complacent. And so we have to prepare for the possibility that COVID will be with us for a little longer and that variant strains can have a different kind of impact. And so the messaging around vaccination has to continue, which is a real challenge. We have vaccines, people just not taking it. The mask wearing and the travel restrictions that have been lifted um, do pose potential risks, but so have been all the decisions that we have taken around relaxation in an attempt to balance the the need for livelihood and lives to coexist two years on. So take, for example, schools. I mean, we know that the positivity rate is going to go up because kids are back in school. But to keep children out of school for, th for the third year, you are doing a damage to our future generation that is almost irreparable. So in a sense, what you're doing is calculating the risk and say, put them back in the classroom, get them to resettle. Some of them have forgotten what school is about, which is why we're having the problems. You heard the minister say that 30 odd thousand of them are lost. They don't know where they are. They have to go find them. So it really is a matter of how you manage the risk. And we thought it was necessary. And I could give you other examples. On the issue of the DRMA, the DRMA has been used unusually long to manage this pandemic. And as the prime minister said, it had to come to an end at some point. It is not that there is no replacement for it. The replacement is the Public Health Act and the Quarantine Act. So in the future, if there is a need to impose masks or something else, what we would do is do it under the Public Health Act or the Quarantine Act, which does allow myself as minister, whoever holds this office, to, 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 to pronounce using that leg those legislations to do uh, almost a similar thing to what would have existed under the DRMA. All right, good afternoon, Doc, and good afternoon to those present here and those listening online. Now, my first question was effectively asked just now, so I'll move on to the other two that don't necessarily require a lengthy response. Now, the message of COVID uh, prevention has seemingly diminished 
was this a tactical move by the government or is it a case where as citizens some of us we have not been paying attention to the COVID-19 related content uh, probably because of COVID fatigue that's the first question and number two where can persons go to seek help and uh, to deal with coping with the effects of COVID-19 for mental wellness and all other side effects of COVID-19 right so the, <clears throat> the, the, the COVID messaging has seemingly been reduced largely because the, 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 the policies that were in effect around restrictions have been relaxed. So there is a natural tendency to feel that the people are going to feel that we no longer care about the threat that exists. That's not the case. Um, I know it's a difficult argument to make, but vaccines are still there, ads are still running, people are still being advised, hospitals are still there responding um, to, to people with COVID or people who need COVID messaging. But as I said, it really was about the balance and trying to get back to some sense of normality because of all the side effects of, of COVID. Um, there, there, are, there are side effects of COVID, which I will speak to if, soon, but has not been recognized. The same NCDs, we're losing people because they have had to wait two years for a surgery, because we had to cut out elective surgeries. People who missed their clinics three, four times, so them hypertension gone out of whack. So mental health, elective procedures and regular clinics, the fatigue of the nurses, who are humans and doctors, those are side effects of some of the measures. So we really needed a relief from that to correct the, the scales. And so it's not that the messaging is dampened or watered down, it's just a change in the trajectory based on the other issues. The other question you asked was about, um, what again? Coping mechanisms. Right, so we're gonna have, to, we have programs now that allows um, a collaboration between the health centers. We have many mental health nurses, we have doctors in the system, we do community outreach. Um, we have collaboration with people like the Red Cross. Um, we have a toll-free line that you can call that is up and running. So there are some existing programs that are in place, but in recognition of the extent to which uh, mental health has been a side effect of the COVID response. There are some additional measures that have to be put in place, which we're working out now, and you'll hear in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, this has been a fantastic uh, uh, afternoon running all the way up, and um, what a tremendous. Um, exchange we have had in this um, lecture series. And we are very thankful that we were privileged to have the Honorable Minister to be here with us today, sharing as our, in this, as our guest lecturer. We have basically come to the end of a wonderful experience. And uh, we are just, Mr. Minister, we are anticipating that you will come back here soon. Uh, whichever we are, however, we are going to have to ensure that you come back to talk with the student body or with somebody else uh, to, to expand on this information because, truth being told, the, the, the information that we received here this afternoon is extremely rich, potent, and most planned, and, and we are anticipating that all those who have listened, both those who are here in the auditorium, and those who followed us online, uh, Facebook and our YouTube channel, have been tremendously blessed from this afternoon's experience. Coming to us now is a former youth parliamentarian and uh, the Department of Communication Studies outstanding student, Mr. Tristan, Tristan Grizzle. He will come at this time and bring for us the vote of thanks. Dr. Merrick Walker, Executive Secretary, Jamaica Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, representing the Chairman of the Board of Governors, Northern Caribbean University. Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tofton, 
Minister of Health and Wellness and Member of Parliament for West Central St. Catherine, Dr. Lincoln Edwards, President of Northern Caribbean University, Dr. Vivian Quarry, Vice President, Academic Administration here at Northern Caribbean University, other Vice Presidents, Deans, Chairs, and other Administrators of Northern Caribbean University, Members of Parliament, and other members of the Ministry of Health, Mr. Neil Brivet, President of the United Student Movement, Northern Caribbean University, Ms. Sandia Chambers Ferguson, Parish Manager, Manchester Health Services, and other members of the Manchester Health Services, Mr. Byron Buckley, Director, Corporate Communications, Marketing, and Public Relations, Northern Caribbean University, alumni, faculty, staff, and students of Northern Caribbean University, members of the Manchester community, both present and those online, well-wishers and friends, a pleasant afternoon to you all. As a nation, we, as we seek to advance out of the COVID-19 pandemic, we, re we recognize and believe that a program of this nature was quite timely and relevant to each one of us present here today, both physically and those joining online, right? Right? All right. Now, risk communication, a public health perspective, has highlighted and educated us all of the need to still be proactive as citizens and exercise our fiduciary responsibility as citizens during the pandemic. We understand that in this era of a constant flow of information, it is in our best interest and for the greater good that we appreciate the right message as purported by the Ministry of Health and Wellness and be influenced by the right content. Risk communication brings to the fore that not all sects or groups of people will be pleased with any one action taken and that there will always be a narrative pushed as to what should be taken as factual and what should be considered as noise and therefore disregarded. We've all been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's do what is right for our benefit and the welfare of our friends and our loved ones as we strive to see the back of the pandemic and live in a Jamaica that is post-COVID very soon. To Dr. Tufton, we say thank you. To our organizers, we say thank you. To our frontline workers present here today and those unavoidably absent, we say thank you. To the members of the media, we say thank you. To those persons present here physically and those joining us virtually, we say thank you. I urge you, therefore, this afternoon, let us use the information that we have received today to become better versions of ourselves, better citizens in our communities, and better citizens for Jamaica. Thank you. I am inviting you now to join me in standing. We are going to be singing the national anthem with Mr. Charles Evans, who will be voicing for us the national anthem. 